The Stream of Time. Welcome back to the history podcast, The Stream of Time. You might be wondering what the title of this episode, Stolot, means. Stolot is Polish for 100 years, but the phrase is also the keystone of the Polish Happy Birthday song. There is no more fitting title for this episode in which we celebrate the nation and people of Poland. November 11, 2018 marks the 100th anniversary of Polish independence. But if you think that's the beginning of Polish history, think again. We are going to go on an over 1,000-year journey through the history of Poland, leading to and past the 1918 independence. Today's episode of The Stream of Time is brought to you by Audible. I have been listening to courses in history books on Audible for years, and most of what I know about history is thanks to Audible's large and easily accessible library. For the listeners of The Stream of Time, Audible is offering a free audiobook download with a free 30-day trial to give you the opportunity to check out their service. This week, I recommend Poland by James Michener. Michener was a superb historical author, and his book on Poland follows a family over multiple generations and covers part of the period I'll be discussing in this episode. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash streamoftime. Again, that's A-U-D-I-B-L-E-T-R-I-A-L dot com slash S-T-R-E-A-M-O-F-T-I-M-E. If you've heard the two Stream of Time episodes on Justinian, titled The Headless Demon, you might remember our 6th century AD Byzantine historian Procopius. Procopius is the first historian to make mention of a peoples known as the Slavs. Now, to be clear, this did not describe a kingdom or a unified tribe or people. Procopius was describing an ethnic group primarily defined by a shared language. Literally, as the word Slav comes from the word Slovo, which means word as in, these people share the same words. But again, the Slavs weren't a unified group or tribe. Indeed, there were many tribes of Slavs who eventually migrated to various areas of what is now mostly Eastern Europe. One such group was the Polans, whose name comes from the old Slavic word pola, which means field or plain. By the 9th century, the Polans had united many of the West Slavic groups in the area whose borders would roughly form modern Poland. But it was the 10th century in which Poland truly became a power player. Sometime in the 960s, the ruler of the Polans that we know of today as Mieszko I converted to Christianity. In Polish, by the way, that would be Mieszko Pierwsze. We, of course, can never know what motivated Mieszko to abandon pagan beliefs and convert to Christianity. Even in modern times, conversion from one religion to another is a big deal for an individual, much less a political leader, so it must have been a huge leap for Mieszko to take. During the ancient times in which Mieszko ruled, conversion of a leader almost always meant that the people under him would convert, sometimes willingly, sometimes by force. Whatever the reason, it was strategically and politically advantageous for the Polans to adopt Christianity. Poland had some Christian neighbors, and being Christian made it a lot harder for neighbors to justify attacking the Polans. Mieszko was not officially king. The first king of Poland would be his son Bolesław, who is often known as Bolesław Chrobre, or Bolesław the Brave. But Mieszko's dynasty, the Piast dynasty, begins with him and would be the rulers of the Kingdom of Poland for a whopping 400 years until the death of Casimir III in 1370, who we'll get to shortly. I said it was strategically and politically advantageous for Poland to become a Christian kingdom with Christian neighbors, and that's true, it helped. On the other hand, you could pick any century in European history from the last 1500 years to see that Christians still fought amongst each other. A lot. In other words, being Christian was one less reason to be attacked by other Christians, but it certainly didn't make Poland immune to hostility from neighboring kingdoms or even internally, earlier on. Plus, not all of Poland's neighbors had converted from pagan beliefs by the time Poland had converted. 
and the conversion of the entire kingdom of Poland itself was not immediate, and caused some unrest in the earlier years. But Poland's most erstwhile foe would prove to be its German neighbors, unsurprisingly, as being neighbors meant frequent fights over territory. While there wasn't constant fighting, we're discussing a period of over 1,000 years in this episode, Germans would pop up again and again as a serious threat to Polish sovereignty over that millennium period, until the end of World War II and post-war Reconstruction, at which point the Soviet Union became Poland's existential enemy, but I'm getting ahead of myself now. So let's get back to the Piast dynasty and the 10th century. Poland's borders stayed relatively stable and consistent over the 400-year reign of the Piast dynasty. In the year 1000, the aforementioned Bolesław Hrobre held the Congress of Gnieszno with the then Holy Roman Emperor Otto III. The Congress of Gnieszno further formalized Poland's connection with Christianity by creating new dioceses in the city areas of Krakow, Wrocław, and Kołobrzeg. But Otto III died two years later, and his successor tried to undo his attempted policies. The Holy Roman Empire at this time was German, and this would be another point in the long timeline of hostility between Poland and German principalities. Just a little over a century after the Congress of Gnieszno, in the year 1109, the Poles defeated a German army under King Henry V of Germany at the Battle of Hunsfeld, or in Polish, Psie. Pole. I won't go into too many details about the battle other than to say that it seems King Henry began a large invasion into Poland, and due to an ambush by Polish soldiers, the Polish victory was utter and complete. Now, while historians are still divided on exactly how important this battle was, it would become an important battle in the collective memory of the Polish nation and people, probably in part because of the fact that it was such a complete victory against a German invading army. This wouldn't be the last time Poles would enjoy such a victory against the German army, and this is something the Germans themselves would remember all the way down to World War I. By the way, our source for most of this very early Polish history is from the Gesta Principum Polonorum, which is Latin for Deeds of the Princes of Poland. It was written by the 12th century Polish historian Gallus Anonymous who is also the earliest Polish author for whom we have writing examples. Unfortunately, Gallus Anonymous is a fancy Latin way of saying that we have no idea what this author's actual name was. The 12th century was a period of many of these gesta, or deeds, type literature. The French had many of their own chansons de geste, or songs of deeds, of which the Chanson de Roland, that's Song of Roland, is probably the most famous example. I'm pointing this out because it's a good illustration that by the 12th century, Poland was a cohesive kingdom with an already rich and interesting history, interesting enough that contemporary scholars felt the need to write about it. In 1138, Poland broke apart, not because of any external threat, but because the Piast king Bolesław III divided Poland into smaller duchies that his multiple sons inherited. Despite an attempt to reunite Polish duchies in the mid-13th century that was foiled by the Mongol invasions, Poland would not ultimately reunite until 1320 under the Polish king Władysław I. But while Władysław reunited the Polish lands back under one kingdom, it was his son, Casimir III, who is typically considered the greatest king of Poland. In Poland, he is commonly known as Kazimierz Wielki or Casimir the Great. He reigned for an astounding 37 years, and during that time, Poland flourished. He strengthened infrastructure across the board, from the judicial system and legal code to the army. He turned a poor and weakened kingdom that he had inherited to one that was strong and rich. He even quarantined Poland during the 14th century plague of the Black Death, and while Poland did suffer to some degree, it did not suffer nearly as badly as other European areas at the time, such as that in Italy and Great Britain, and Kazimierz Wielki gets due credit for this fact. And while Jewish people had already enjoyed many rights in Poland since the mid-13th century, Kazimierz Wielki took it further and considered Jews to be people of the king, a protected people, 
and made it effectively illegal to harass Jews under penalty of death. This enlightened relationship between the Poles and the Jews would effectively last until Poland was broken up in the late 18th century, and the three powers of Russia, Prussia, and Austria had a less conciliatory approach to Jewish culture. And after a century of persecution under these three powers, culminated in the tragedy of the Holocaust. In other words, sadly, it was because Poland and its people were so open and welcoming to the Jews that the nation's Jews became such a target under the horrible Nazi regime. Kazimierz Wielki had another legacy that was both enlightened and commendable, but would also ultimately lead to problems centuries down the road for Poland. It was under Kazimierz that the seeds of the Golden Liberty, in Polish, Rzeczpospolita Szlachecka, began. In return for military support, Kazimierz granted more equality among Polish aristocrats of various affluence. This meant that Poland had a much larger aristocracy than most European nations, with as much as 10% of the kingdom being considered aristocrats known as the Szlachta. Contrast this with, for example, 19th and early 20th century Russia, which had roughly 1% of aristocracy, which created the tensions that led to the Russian Revolution. I'll stop short of calling the Golden Liberty democratizing. But widening the definition of aristocracy did have an equalizing effect for the population. Keep this in mind as we move forward, because it's going to become a problem later on. Kazimierz Wielki died in 1370, ending the 400-year Piast dynasty. Having a close alliance with Hungary, he had named the Hungarian king Louis as his successor. Louis's daughter, Jadwiga, in English, Hedwig, would become the first female Polish monarch. Jadwiga would then marry the Lithuanian duke, Jogaila. This was important for two reasons. For one, it would begin the Jagiellonian dynasty, who would be kings of Poland until 1572. But more importantly, it would create a union with Lithuania that created the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth the most powerful kingdom in Eastern Europe at the time. This began a bit of a golden age for Poland, and for the next few hundred years, the kingdom mostly grew. In fact, at one point during the 17th century, a Polish invading army installed a Polish Tsar in Russia. The Russians call this period the Time of Troubles, which probably tells you how well this went. And of course, this put gasoline on the fire of animosity between Poland and Russia. It was also during the 17th century, in 1683 to be exact, that Poland provided vital military support to the city of Vienna, the power center of the Habsburg Holy Roman Empire, which was under devastating siege by the Ottoman Turks. Under the young Polish king Jan III Sobieski, the Polish Hussars, or Husarzy Towarzywi, an elite cavalry force with beautiful bewinged armor, led one of the last great medieval cavalry charges, dealing a crushing blow to the Ottoman Turks, saving Vienna, and ending the siege. Unfortunately for Poland, a resurgent Austria wasn't good for Poland, and this cavalry charge could almost be considered the high watermark of the golden era of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. In fact, over the course of the 18th century, Poland got extremely unlucky in the dice roll when it came to neighbors. To Poland's south, the Austrian-led Habsburg Holy Roman Empire, this is the one that Voltaire called neither holy, nor Roman, nor an empire, was consolidating power. To the east, under the momentum started by Peter the Great, a looming Russia began to set its sights toward Europe. And to the west, following the 17th century's Thirty Years' War, Prussia emerged as yet another growing German threat, especially under the great Prussian king general, Frederick the Great. And while these three neighbors grew in power over the next century, Poland was becoming weaker internally. While the golden liberty begun by Kazimierz Wielki had been a wonderful move towards equality, it also had the potential to weaken centralized power by spreading it around among more people. The problem is that this wasn't democracy. The Schlachte was still around 10% of the population. 
That meant that the voting pool wasn't so huge that it couldn't be manipulated on a person-by-person -person basis. Every person in the Schlachta, no matter how poor, had an equal vote, and those votes could be bought. That's exactly what happened over the course of the 18th century. The three powers of Russia, Prussia, and Austria would manipulate the individual Polish Schlachta members through bribery to vote in the best interest of their patron kingdoms. Over time, this had two negative effects. First, they weakened the power of a centralized authority, such as the king. And second, they would often result in votes that went nowhere, as only a few people could throw a wrench in the whole voting process. The Polish governing authority was paralyzed and slowly being strangled out of relevance completely. This came to a head in 1795. In 1795, Poland was taken off the map, literally. The three powers of Russia, Prussia, and Austria divided Poland up and each incorporated a piece into their empires. While there was an attempt to restore part of the kingdom during the Napoleonic Wars in 1807, the restored smaller state didn't last past the end of the wars in 1815, when the larger powers repartitioned Poland at the Congress of Vienna. The division was devastating and traumatic. The Polish people held on to their culture and language, even as the governing powers made attempts to force their own respective languages and culture, German or Russian, on the Polish people. And as I mentioned, it was during this century that persecutions among these powers on the Polish Jews began that would eventually lead to the 20th century Holocaust. It was a terrible, traumatic situation. But the Polish people never gave up the idea of regaining their lost nation. Their chance came up again in World War I. Even among the non-Polish, restoring Poland had long been something that many considered important. In American President Woodrow Wilson's January 8, 1918 speech, he outlined his famous 14 points that were intended to be used for peace negotiation to end World War I. Point 13 was the restoration of Poland. And when Germany and Austria lost the war, they ceded their control of Polish lands. Poland also got lucky. Germany had knocked Russia out of the war in 1917 and through the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk had taken Russia's portion of Poland. This meant Poland effectively was able to retrieve all of its former lands without having to negotiate with Russia. Poland had gained its full independence again. But the next 20 years were unstable and transformative for the world, and with the rise of the terrifying Stalinist Soviet Union to the east and fascist and racist Nazi Germany to the west, Poland found itself at the center of yet another devastating conflict, as it was the German invasion of Poland in September 1939 that began World War II. I could do a whole episode on Poland and World War II, so forgive me if I gloss over the facts here, but suffice to say, Poland was double-crossed by pretty much everyone. The Soviet Union invaded Poland from the east, intending to peacefully, I say that with air quotes, stop any threat from Germany by dividing Poland between the two of them. Of course, not surprisingly, at least everyone on the planet except Stalin, the Soviet Union was also double-crossed by Hitler's Nazi Germany, and World War II dragged on for another six years until 1945. And again, the Polish people, double-crossed many times over by this point, had the agency of their own destiny snatched from them, as the West allowed the Soviet Union to crush any resistance and incorporate Poland into its empire. Again, attempts were made by a larger power to erase Polish culture and language as the Soviet Union tried to enforce Russian as the dominant language. But again, the Polish people retained their strong identity, and so it is no surprise that Poland was at the front center of internal resistance against the Soviet Union in the early 1980s with the Solidarity Movement, founded by the shipyard worker Lech Wałęsa. Solidarity, in Polish Solidarność, was the first independent labor union in the Soviet Union. Even through an attempt by the communist government to institute martial law, the movement went forward and helped to form a coalition government in 1989, eventually getting Lech Wałęsa elected president in 1990 as the Soviet Union itself crumbled. 
Poland moved ahead as a strong independent nation, with an economy growing for almost three decades and record highs for the European Union, which it joined in 2004. As Poland moves to celebrate the 100-year anniversary of its independence from Russia, Prussia, and Austria, on November 11, 2018, Poland's future looks bright, a future that the Polish people have never doubted. This is reflected in the first line of the Polish national anthem, Jeszcze Polska nie zginęła, which means Poland is not yet lost. And with that, we leave this episode with the Polish national anthem played beautifully on violin.